Self-sufficiency. What other term in the homesteading sphere carries such a weight of history, responsibility, and hope? Visions of lush, productive gardens, cozy wood stoves crackling with hand-split hardwood, provisions lining the pantry shelves, and healthy animals moving through the fields all dance in our heads, backed by resounding questions. Is it actually possible? What do I need to do to get there? How did the homesteaders of the past make it work? For the past seven years, I've embarked on a quest of self-sufficiency, and I am positive it is no holy grail forged of unobtainium. So sit down with me for a minute. Let's talk about what it takes to get started on this adventure. So what is self-sufficiency? This is the definition I'm striving toward. And remember, this is my personal long mold and long hard fought for view as someone currently in the trenches. If you disagree with my self-sufficiency semantics, go ahead and talk about it in the comments below. You're welcome to. So to sum up, I believe self-sufficiency is developing the mental and physical fortitude and practices that provide for your own needs with your own land and also changing your identity from consumer to producer. It may be easy to define, but it's a lifelong journey. The important thing is to start the process and to start it now. Make it an adventure. Every step forward is a success, no matter how small it feels at the outset. Now, the most important place to start, in my opinion, is with food. And other worthy abilities are worth discussing and pursuing. And I have lots of resources on those in the book list that I've provided at the end of this video. But the, for the purposes of this video right now, I'm gonna stick mostly to food and water and crucially, yet hardly discussed, the mental attitude needed to become self-sufficient in these areas. So here's 11 steps to start the self-sufficient transition. If you haven't done it yet, start gardening now and expand it every year. Growing your own fruits and vegetables is crucial to providing the vitamins, minerals, and delicious flavors that make dinner something to savor. It doesn't matter how much of a novice you are, and learn how to manage your plants, rotate crops, and fight the pests local to your area. There are tons of resources and huge communities surrounding you that are willing to help you learn. And we've got lots of articles over on Insteading too. Now, once you get your fingernails dirty, it's time to look at refining your gardening practices. If you can't rake in a harvest without using fertilizers and pesticides from the store, including organic fertilizers, or if you have to use pest deterrents, you found a red flag on your journey to self-sufficiency. Learning how to compost your land's plant material, such as autumn leaves, which are one of very many underutilized resources, learning how to recycle nutrients from your animal's manure, and how to manage pests with what your land produces, like wood ashes, for example. They can get rid of slugs and snails. This is crucial to making your garden the most it can be. Now, of course, no discussion on self-sufficiency is complete without that million dollar question. How big a garden do you need to be self-sufficient? But the truth is, there's no viable answer to that question. Gardening styles vary in harvest per square foot, every plant offers different nutrients, and the crops that someone could grow in their specific climate varies. Every garden is as varied as the gardeners growing them. It's more important to focus on your skills as a gardener as preserver instead. A garden is really only a step to self-sufficiency as far as it can be maintained and regrown the next year, and preserved in enough quantity to get through you through until the next harvest. So my advice is this. As you figure out how much garden space is needed to feed your own family, focus on a few specific key crops, tomatoes, leafy greens, squash, onions, and beans, or whatever is key to you that your family eats the most. Find out how much you need in a year. You might even consider keeping a year-long record of how much you eat through the seasons to give yourself an estimate for future planning. Then find out how to grow that amount in however much garden it requires. And there you go. You have your personal answer for how big to grow your garden. Don't worry if you don't harvest enough this year. Work on getting more in consecutive years until you reach your goal. Does that sound like a huge project? It's because it is, but don't be intimidated. This is a huge, exciting challenge and it's worth the attempt. Also, to expand your gardening potential, I recommend planting successive crops to get the most for your harvest. Start as early as possible with cold tolerant plants like kale, spinach, and peas. Then as the ground heats up, interplant with tomatoes, peppers, and other heat loving plants that will replace them as the cold plants wither. Then as the year cools down, replant more cold loving plants to take the place of the frostbitten okra and tomatoes. Be sure to fertilize and reapply mulch with every replacement and you could get as many as three harvests from a single garden plot. Number two, learn how to save seeds and which seeds to save. Now, once you get your gardening game going, I recommend switching entirely over to heirloom crops. Not only do these old favorites produce some of the most visually stunning vegetables, they also produce seed that is true, unlike the popular hybrids you often find at the store. 
Being able to save seeds from the best of your plants every year will not only give you plants that are specifically adapted to your specific climate, but it will also ensure that you can plant the fruits and vegetables that you need with the supplies that you have. Annie's Heirlooms, Baker Creek Seeds, and Seed Savers Exchange are great places to start looking for seeds. The best part is, once you get good at saving those seeds, you may never have to buy seeds or starts for those plants again. I use Baker Creek's Heirloom Life Gardener and Suzanne Ashworth's Seed to Seed as resources for knowing how to save seeds. I'm a relative newbie, but those books have been a huge help. Number three, find your staple crop and find out how much it takes to support your family for a year. The fresh veggies from the garden and fruits from the orchard are the flavors and color of a meal, but you won't have everything you need until you secure your staple food. This is the food that forms the backbone of your diet. Staple food has taken tons of different forms around the world. Maize, cassava, rice, wheat, millet, potatoes, and so on. The key feature of a staple food is that it supplies carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and can be stored well for long periods of time. So what does that look like on your land? How do you process and store it? How much do you need to grow? You gotta find that out. Part of this mental aspect of self-sufficiency that I'm going to mention later in this video includes being okay with whatever that staple ends up being. If you grew up on wheat-based products, but you can only get corn or millet to grow on your land, are you willing to relearn everything and start a new life on that but dependable staple? Studying the cuisines of the cultures native to your area or native to the staple that you're finding success with is a gastronomical adventure that may result in some delicious, unique meals that you found nowhere else. Number four, breed your source of protein and land fertility. Now there are those who will disagree with me on this, and that's fine, but I believe that self-sufficiency requires a relationship with domesticated livestock. I know that many hunter-gatherer groups were able to support themselves with hunting alone, but those groups usually weren't based in a single location. Now I know I'm probably poking a hornet's nest by saying this, but I don't believe you can manage long-term self-sustainability on vegetables and fruits alone. Please note, I'm not implying that you can't homestead as a vegetarian or vegan, I'm just discussing terms of self-sustainability. If there are any vegans or vegetarians who have managed to be totally self-sustaining in their diet without store-bought supplements, please share below and add to the conversation. Anyway, the manures provided by animals that you keep are also a vital source of garden fertility. The nutrient cycle of your land can be complete with these things included. You can manage good soil fertility with vegetable compost. The nearings of the Good Life book, if you've read that, they were vehemently dedicated to that cycle, so I know it's possible. However, I see the relationship between livestock and humans differently than they did, and if you work animals into your land's fertility plan, you will quickly see that they are absolutely essential elements to homestead life. So, you can figure out what animals you can and want to raise, and then you need to learn how to feed, house, and breed them in healthy, sustainable ways. Whether you choose sheep, fish, goats, chickens, ducks, cattle, or even meat pigeons, because yes, that's a thing, make sure you can find a way to use everything they offer you, not just meat. Because every creature has many aspects to them. They can offer pest control, fertility to the land, unwanted brush to manure conversion, and so on find a way to utilize that. And finally, make it a goal to build up a good relationship with nearby animal keepers so that you can trade breeding stock and avoid inbreeding. Number five, feed your animals entirely from your own land. For the self-sustaining homestead, producing all the animal feed you need rather than buying supplemental feed probably means that you'll never have huge herds or huge flocks, but you'll probably have enough. You need to work hard to provide your animals with access to forage, and if they can't free range safely, you might instead have to bring that forage to them daily. With fewer animals, that's actually possible as a daily chore. You should also start practicing the ancient skill of harvesting and curing hay from your own land, and try using scythes and rakes if you really want to go for broke. It is quite an enjoyable, even poetic chore. If you want, check out the Scythe book for a beautifully written and highly useful write-up on this undersung part of sustainable living. Another part of the house to consider when it comes to feeding your animals is whether or not there are any pets that are a part of your home. Can you find a way to feed your birds, cats, and dogs from resources you can nurture on your own land? Number six, store enough food to get you through the winter. When I read the Little House on the Prairie series as an adult, I get chills. Much of the content of those stories are detailed portraits of people who spent their entire year preparing for the winter and doing it successfully. I know that people the world around have done this for centuries, but I've never done it. I don't know how to do it yet. And you may find yourself in a similar place as a child of the technological era, where grocery stores and snow plows make fresh tomatoes, exotic coconuts, and strawberries available all year round, no matter what the reality is outside. We can rediscover how to ferment, pickle, preserve, dry, and store provisions. Books like The Art of Fermentation, Preserving Food Without Freezing or Canning, and Stocking Up can give you the guidance to reclaim these not entirely lost arts. Number seven, get your water off the grid. 
you, your plants, and your animals will only thrive if there's water. If your water is on the grid and gets cut off for whatever reason, all your hard work can quite literally dry up. I've written a long article on all the resources we've used while getting our homestead water off grid, and you can find it here. We'll actually be turning that article into a video soon as well, so be on the lookout for that as well. Now let's talk about the mental steps towards a self-sufficient life. As you make that transition, you may have to confront many issues in yourself, fears, uncertainties, inadequacies, and self-doubt. On this journey of fortifying your resources, you will also need to develop a fortified mind. Pursuing self-sufficiency will force you to learn when you don't know, to try even if you don't know how it will end, shut down your inner doubting voices, and to choose to not fear. Talk about a crash course in real life. So let's talk about how to do that. Number eight. Get out of debt. Debt is a mental roadblock as much as it is a financial hurdle. If you are currently paying off student loans or trying to get out of debt, fight as hard as you can to liberate yourself. If that means canceling your subscription services, foregoing that daily latte, cooking your own food, walking more, and not needing to go out on the town to have a good time, you're already practicing self-sufficiency. I wrote an article about frugal living that's full of more good tips. You can check it out here in the link we have in the description box below. Number nine, never have a pity me mentality. Deciding to start the journey of self-sufficiency should have the same feeling as an adventurer setting out into unknown territory, full of excitement, anticipation, and maybe a little trepidation, but mostly brave-eyed exploration. No one is forcing you on this journey. It should be an intrinsic desire to live better, more meaningfully, less wastefully, less dependently, and so on. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you. It is hard work, perhaps the hardest you will ever work. But if you wanna live this way and you wanna work hard, it is the most satisfying of efforts. And if you'd rather spend your downtime after work catching up on your Netflix, or if you start getting jealous of your normal friends, that's another red flag to stop and take a moment to look over your motivations. Maybe you're trying to do too much too soon. It could be that you're lacking a shared end goal with your family, and maybe they just see it as your weird side project. Maybe you need to reevaluate why you started this journey in the first place. A self-victimizing mentality will be the biggest block to your self-sufficiency. So if you're starting to hate where you are, do something about it, even if that means taking a break. Learning how to produce what you need and want shouldn't have to be a drudge and an ordeal. Let me give you an example. Last year, I decided to quit coffee, which was something I truly did like, but I knew I couldn't grow it and so I decided it wasn't worth it. This didn't mean I wasn't allowed to have delicious drinks. <laughs> Finding our acorn chicory alternative was such a fun, enjoyable process for me and my family that there was really no reason to complain. Number 10, get rid of your addictions. Now the term addiction has often only been associated with alcohol and drugs, but change that word to dependence, which has essentially the same meaning, and suddenly you may see it in your life. What would ruin your day if you couldn't have it? Can you not function without your morning cup or cups of coffee? Would you throw in the literal towel if your dishwasher broke down for good? Do you find yourself checking for the presence of your cell phone in your pocket just to make sure it's there? If your social media accounts were suddenly vaporized, would you still know how to interact with friends? All these distractions and dependencies, however innocuous they may seem on the surface, are dependent on something you can't control, and they're mining you for your time and your data. If you really need something that you can't produce yourself, and that thing is not crucial to life, seriously question whether or not it's taking more from you than it's worth. Number 11, eliminate the concept of waste and see it as a resource. Being able to waste something, toss it in the trash, or flush it away, what you don't want to have to deal with, is a consumerist privilege taken by those who are decidedly not seeking self-sufficiency. In a nutrient cycle of a self-sufficient homestead, there's essentially no waste. Everything is a nutrient that just needs to be put back into the next step of the process. At the end of the day, to waste, waste is a waste. When you're growing all of your own food, the idea of throwing out leftovers should become a crime to the worst degree. You gotta rethink all inedible food scraps as man and manure as soil fertility in the making and then route it as such. We use our chickens to recycle garden cuttings, spent plants, and inedible food scraps. Chickens are fantastic fertilizer factories. Anything that your chickens can't eat can go into a humanure pile. This is things like chicken bones from making soup stock and any fruit and veggie peels that are toxic to them. All of it can eventually go back into the garden or orchard after being safely composted, and that cycle will just keep on going. So is it true? Is self-sufficiency really possible? In a word, I believe yes. 
I would honestly argue that the modern definitions of self-sufficiency has been made far too narrow in the 21st century. Honestly, the truth is self-sufficiency is a progression and a long process of infrastructure building, skill acquisition, mental paradigm shifting, and resource prioritizing. For those of us who are starting from scratch, it may take a lifetime, but as you start to forge your own independence from all the various outside systems vying for your data, time, and resources, you may see that self-sufficiency doesn't benefit the economy very well or keep you under someone else's direct control. Perhaps that's why there's so much fire against it. I truly believe that self-sufficiency means that you're able to produce the necessary foodstuffs and items you need to live, that you know how to replenish them, and you aren't dependent on those outside inputs to keep your family, land, and animals alive. The main point is, if your access to outside resources were cut, you could carry on. You'd be able to sufficiently supply your needs for survival, yourself self-sufficiency. But in the meantime, that standard doesn't mean that you're not allowed to go trade with neighbors, use cast iron pans, wear shoes, or go out for ice cream, or go on the internet to work. If I was finally at the stage where we were growing 100% of our own food and had secured all of the necessary resources and we were weaving our own cloth from homegrown wool, future goals, I'd still go to the store and buy a bar of chocolate to enjoy, even though I couldn't grow the cacao plant myself. Chocolate's not a need, so we can totally survive without it but it's a wonderful thing to enjoy. Now it takes a long time and a lot of work to get the whole shebang running. In the meantime, however, you can take the steps to develop wonderful relationships with your neighbors and learn from the farmers at the market. And then you can just laugh at how you're hardly living the draconian, isolationist, hard scrabble existence that seems to be the stereotype of folks seeking self-sufficiency. I hope we can all reach this goal someday. And I hope you can also agree that it's a dang fun adventure. It's the best sort of life to live. There is so much more to talk about when it comes to self-sufficiency, but rather than regaling you further with my relatively newfound knowledge, I want to point you in the direction of my teachers. Most videos, this one included, just can't contain nearly all the information you really need to know to reach true self-sufficiency. So if you, like me, don't know where to find that information, books are a great way to fill the knowledge gap left by our lack of cultural training. Though your neighbors may also be a huge help, these books often hold information that most modern people seem to lack. Following books should give you a far more broad resource of information to help you along your way. Where indicated, these books are available for free in their entirety on the invaluable website archive.org. I strongly encourage you to check it out. And even if there isn't a free online version available, these are well worth your time to check out from the library or to buy from their publishers. Many of the out of print books are still also relatively easy to find on eBay or on thrift books. Now here we go. The first one I'll recommend is The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency by John Seymour, which is available online for free. This is an excellent and detailed resource on those looking to really grapple with the ins and outs of a self-sufficient life. The Self-Sufficiency Handbook by Alan Bridgewater, also completely available online, was written by a couple of Back to the Landers from the 70s. This one gives many options for self-sufficiency, from high-tech gadgetry to the old techniques your great-grandfather used. Cottage Economy by William Cobbett, also for free online. This one's an oldie, but a goodie. William Cobbett was advocating for people to handle their own needs as far back as 1821. The Complete Herbal Handbook for Farm and Stable. This is the only animal care book I recommend in terms of self-sufficiency. Julia is a super old school teacher and teaches methods on animal care from materials that you can grow and forage on your own land. Almost all modern books entirely rely on store-bought materials, minerals, feed, and medicine. This one's also for free online as well. There's the Foxfire series. This is a huge treasure trove of stories, diagrams, and anecdotes from the self-reliant Appalachians, documented and preserved before their wisdom disappeared with them. There are several of these available online, but not all of them. Bittersweet's another great resource. This is an Ozark version of the Foxfire Project that is also entirely available online. The Scythe Book. Cut, harvest, and cure your own hay without any machines. Liquid Gold. Turn urine into a resource, not waste. This is a very important one to me, the Humanure Handbook. I know it sounds unsavory, but this is the go-to guide for safely composting human waste into soil fertility. It's free online and it's well worth looking into. Rosemary Gladstar's Medicinal Herbs. It's a good start for knowing and growing your own medicinal herbs. The Forager's Harvest, Nature's Garden, and Incredible Wild Edibles by Samuel Thayer. The best foraging books I've ever found. Videos of Samuel Thayer teaching are available online in the link I've given here. 
30 Plants That Can Save Your Life, and The Backyard Medicine Chest. These are by Douglas Shar, and he's got a weird sense of humor, but he gives you a wonderfully straightforward introduction into herbal medicine. Back to basics. This one's a really interesting one to look through for a general look at homesteading, but you should note that its sister book, Homesteading, the homesteading title in the series, it is not worth the purchase, so skip that one. Next, we have two books by Art Ludwig, Tanks, Cisterns, Aquifers, and Ponds, and also Create an Oasis with Gray Water. Both of these books are great resources on how to store off-grid water and how to use gray water as a resource, not a waste. Another great book, The Bread Builders. It's all about using sourdough and also how to build a wood-fired oven to cook that sourdough. Preserving food without freezing or canning. These traditional methods from France allow you to save food in a much more sustainable off-grid manner. Stocking up? This one's online. This book is like having a knowledgeable grandma in your kitchen, guiding you through your first time canning. Next, we've got The Art of Fermentation by Sandor Katz. He takes you through how to ferment anything and everything. The Art of Natural Cheese Making. This is my favorite renegade cheese making book by David Asher. We have The Basic Butchering of Livestock and Game which is available for free online, and this book gives really clear diagrams. Edible Forest Gardens, book one and two, are great resources for both the novice and seasoned grower. Then there's Baker Creek's helpful gardening book, The Heirloom Life Gardener. Really good resource for growing and also saving seeds from heirloom plants. The Complete Vegetable and Herb Gardener by Burpee. This is a wonderfully thorough resource on growing and harvesting pretty much any vegetable you can think of. Then there's Permaculture, a designer's manual. Now I know this one's like a textbook, but it's a textbook you actually want to read. Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard. You can knit together your gardens, orchards, and animals together in a land revitalizing endeavor with the philosophy in this book. Next, Keeping Warm with an Axe. Firewood, it's the material that warms you both when you cut it and when you burn it. Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth is completely available for free online. And this is without a doubt my favorite resource on knowing how to save pure heirloom seeds. I wouldn't be without this one. Now, Whew, I know that's a lot. Happy reading, everyone. These are some of my own personal favorites, but obviously there's lots more out there. Let us know in the comments below, what are your favorite resources for learning how to live self-sufficiently?